Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Kodakery. This is Kodak's podcast where we interview creative people with great stories and talk about their contributions to film, art, and science. I'm Megan. And I'm Josh. And today we are in the Kodakery with Tassa Dean, an internationally acclaimed artist and filmmaker. So let's jump into the Kodakery and talk with Tasta. Tassada, thank you so much for joining us today. We're so excited to have you with us uh, for our first episode of the Kodakery, which is going to be Kodak's official podcast, where we interview creative people and discuss film and art and technology and all kinds of different things. So thank you so much for joining us this morning. You're welcome. So we want to talk to you about film advocacy, about your work, about uh, so many topics. One of the things I'm really interested in is when, when did you pick up your first camera? Like, when was it that you really... I mean, you've obviously been drawn to film, and it's, I would, hopefully it's fair to say it's your, kind of your chosen medium. When was it that that really started? When did you pick up your first camera, take your first photo? Well, my father, I'm, I remember um, my father had a sort of Canon uh, wind-up Standard 8 camera that I started to pick up, and you could still get Standard 8 film at that point. And I, my first time was, I guess I was about... I don't know, 15, 16, that sort of age, filming out of the window of the house on Standard 8. And then when I went and um, down to Falmouth, I, I remember buying um, a Super 8 camera from a guy, you know, from through a small ad. So I definitely began with Super 8, and I took an inordinate, you know, a lot of Super 8 films when I was an undergraduate. But then I was um, very soon... Um, in, in fact, my, my first year undergraduate, I, I started to make animations on 16 millimeter. So, but I have to say that I was always in painting department, so I never, I never was in a film or media department in my whole art school career. I was always in painting, you know. And even when I was in postgraduate, and I was in the painting department, and and I made my first film, I was which I couldn't even get into sort of basic kind of distribution, which I think is very fortunate. Mm-hmm. But a lot of people that studied just film at the Slade, which is sort of what you would call experimental film, um, you know, they were just making film. And then and they took the sort of festival route, um, experimental film route. And I took the sort of more art, uh, you know, gallery, museum, you know, wall-based uh, route and therefore my um, desire was to show my films in relation to my other things, and that at the beginning was the big struggle was to get the films shown as as films in in galleries and museums. And at the beginning, it wasn't easy at all. But I was of the generation of the young British artists, and everyone was beginning to make uh, video works and and it was the the creation of a context except i was more difficult because i mine were films so and that's a place where you were really almost breaking new ground in the art world be, trying to get films projected in galleries and yeah well, there were some i mean i had there were people there were a few people like stan douglas who's um a canadian artist i remember he seeing films on loop systems in his show at the ica and, and so i and you know he he was a context for me. But yeah, no, it was the early days of showing film in art galleries and museums. And it was, you know, I had terrible times with it too. You know, I mean, I have installation photographs of, you know, half-drunk wine glasses on my loop systems, you know, broken loop systems with film on the floor. You know, that that's what it was like. It was, it's been a hard, hard to perfect it so that they, they function and, um, and we've perfected it now. I mean, some some of my films, you know, show on loop systems and never break down. You know, but the, in the bad old days, they did used to break down. So, you know, museums never particularly loved doing it. But now it, we've sorted it out and, and it's, uh, you know, and it's become sort of normal to see loop systems in, in, in art code. So what was it when, uh, one of the things that I'm always, uh, I'm always interested in, I know we're going to have a lot of, of other artists and young people who are trying to trying to make that jump from school into being a professional artist. So when you talk about how you were breaking into the art world, when was kind of what you consider your first breakthrough where you really 
um, got things in galleries, and, and kind of how did that happen? Well, it's funny because, you know, the art has changed so much. When I was at Falmouth, you know, no one really had a future. Um, you know, to be an artist with a with a career was happening possibly in America and to a few people, but it didn't really seem like it was a, a you know, a real um, possibility. And then um, I was, I went to the Slade and I got into two exhibitions that were really important for students and um, at that time, which was the New Contemporaries and the Barclays Young Artist Award, which were two kind of open submission. And I got into both of them. So I was very lucky in a way. I had a very easy sort of step in. But of course, it's, you know, I was never meteoric. Uh, um, my work has always been quite slow and, and un, unsensational. So it's been a, a kind of uh, not a very uh, sharp gradient as it is for some uh, artists, but, it, you know, like a slow plod in a way. So that's more like what happened to me. But I, then again, I have to s stress that I was really lucky that my generation was the, the young British artist generation, although I wasn't really ever a young British artist because my work didn't quite fit into that sort of trope, as it were. But I, you know, that suddenly, you know, the, the, having a, a life as an artist was a, became a real possibility about that time. And even, like, the generation older than me, I think it has been, was much harder, and there were, you know, somehow it was f fewer of them, and, you know, now it's normalized, but it was a, you know, it was a period when art, you know, has, has totally kind of turned 180 degrees in popularity. I remember when I was, what, I, like, student age, we'd go to the Tate, it was only open on a Sunday between 2 to 5 or 2 to 6, and it would be empty. And now I was there in London recently. You know, it's it's unbelievable. It's just packed. So some revolution has happened in in the visual arts. Um, you know, not not all for the good. I don't think necessarily, but it it has meant that there is suddenly a possibility and a, a context for it. And I think that's been huge. So I, I'm very lucky in the generation that I was born into. I think. And do you think it's do you think it's easier now for for somebody to break in? I mean, do you think the industry? Did... Oh yeah, I think it's much much easier now because there's so much more of it. Right. You know, there are many more galleries. You know, and I mean, I, I have to say also as a, as a woman, I mean, it wasn't so easy for the generation before me really if you were a woman and an artist. But now it's just I think pretty parallel. So yeah, much easier. There's hundreds of galleries now. There used to be any. Well, thank you. Right. Well, and then just means to distribute work via the internet to get people to see your work. It seems like there's more avenues now to reach out to people and to build an audience than maybe there was, you know, in years past. Yeah, there's, I mean, it's an audience and a market um, because, of course, artists need a market to be able to carry on. Um, there's, you know, a decreasing amount of public funding for it and it is becoming more and more sort of privatized in a way and so yeah artists you know yeah audience equals um market too for your inspiration for your work i mean for all of the work whether it's the slates or the films um how does it come to you like what is it that draws you to different things i mean whether it's the green ray or i think with the kodak project we I think with your love of film, I think that makes sense how you'd be drawn to that subject matter. But for so much of your work, where do you find inspiration and and how does it come to you? How do you start to bring a project to life? Well, it's a difficult question because every single one has a different uh, reason. And it's not like you know. Um, sometimes things don't become apparent. I mean, Kodak, it was a love of film, but it was also a frustration. I mean, at the time, I was trying to buy... Um, some black and white film from my 60 millimeter camera and was told that, you know, they didn't make it anymore, which is, of course, the beginning of a long journey we've just been on. And, and that, um, and it was all about this place, this Chalon du Sun, which is where Kodak used to be in France, the factory in France. And, uh, you know, for years, I'd, people would say, well, we'll have to see if we can get it from Chalon. It was this sort of fictional place in a way in my head. But then it turned out that they didn't make it anymore. So I just suddenly had the desire to, you, you know, I bought some on uh, secondhand 
film and I wanted to use it on the the you know reflexively to film the the, the place that manufactured it um, and just at that moment um, even though the the people in the factory didn't even realize but actually they were closing that place so in the time that I had the idea and and the time that I actually filmed it they you know stopped the film production part they were still making x-ray films so it was a very like we're talking just a few weeks so it was just fortuitous. I mean, I work with a lot with chance um, and um, contingency, and and that was an example of just being lucky. Because had I even been got in contact with them, just a, a couple of you know, even two weeks later, it would have been too late. Yeah. So, so was, uh, you know, in a way, that was lucky. But yeah, it happened sort of organically in a way. You didn't set out to do it. No, I didn't set out to do right. it at all. And then when I when I went down to visit, because they said, of course, that, you know, it's too late. They said it's too late. And I said, well, I, I, too late is, is, is what I, you know, is what I do. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so they let me come down, because which was very unusual, because, you know, at that time, Kodak was, well, you should probably know this, but they were very um, anxious about industrial espionage. So they never let anyone film in their factories. And so this was a, a new thing. And what impressed me about uh, the Kodak factory in Chalon has how, uh, which I thought was particularly French, is its relationship to a sort of wider kind of artistic context. Like even the, the, the rooms where the workers used to rest and have cigarettes were, were it was called Celle de Rodin, you know, after the, the sculptor Rodin, which I thought was, you know, fantastic, you know, relationship between you know this in, this industrial production and 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 fine art and the the you know the 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 ceo or the director of the place was a, you know was a very um intelligent man and he said well if you can come next week you, you can come so i literally had to scramble the whole thing together very very quickly and then the when they were and they was he phoned me in that in fact in the intervening week and said listen we want to clear up the film packaging you know, we want to clear it up. And I said, no, no, please, lady, don't touch it, don't touch it. And, um, and they didn't touch it, which was great. But it was like awful sort of, uh, you know, with all the film on the floor and the sprocket dust everywhere. And, and actually I picked out, I mean, this is an example of, 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 of you know, actually working as an artist. But in the, they had these sprocketing machines and in it was a, a strip of uh, negative where the sprockets had, you know, they were, it was sprocketing and then it stopped. And I picked out a few of these strips and I, and I framed them and they, I called it sound obsolescence because in a way it was like the sprockets had stopped, you know, the machine had stopped and the sprockets had stopped. It was very moving. Right. You know, that was 2006. And, um, you know, which was like the first real wind of, of this whole, um, you know, annihilation of this fantastic medium. So that was the beginning, in a way. And then, of course, in 2011, um, they closed my lab in, in um, London, which became the second step in this. You know, it's so rapid. It was so rapid. Yeah. Well, you know that. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's one of the things with disruptive technology can come in and change something so quickly. So, I mean, I, it definitely it has moved, but the the work that you've done to advocate for a film has been something that you know we obviously appreciate very much and it's obviously driven by your love of the work and of the medium yeah well that's the point you know that's been the big misunderstanding film is a medium for many people it's a medium it's not a technology it was never a technology to me you know that's that's been the profound a misunderstanding I think or, or, I mean it's obviously been used to the advantage of people that wanted to see it just in that technological way so that they could um, you know put it on this one way trajectory right. of you know toward obsolescence which of course is very useful mm -hmm. if you're invested in in the new product you want you want the old one to just you know go um, but you know it was, it was never a technology for me I, you know I used it in the same way as I used um, chalk or paint or um, ink or anything else that I, you know, I use. So it it just felt incomprehensible to me that they could lose such a great medium so so carelessly, actually. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, like any digital, like Photoshop hasn't made it so people don't go buy pencils or don't go buy paint. It's another tool for an artist to choose from. And and that that's something that's resonated um, I think with us very strongly about the way that you've discussed film is that it's artist choice. It's a medium that should be there in the toolbox when an artist chooses it. And, uh, well, that's okay. I think that's true. But I think even you didn't quite get that a while ago. Kodak, I mean, the company. Yeah. I think it's, you know, been... Uh, now I think you do. And I think that's a great hope, actually, for your company is that you're suddenly realizing... In, a, in what you have um, but a few you know very very recently um, I think sadly the company was you know quite happy to well not happy but driven to just sort of jettison it financially but I'm very glad about this turnaround with Kodak that this sort of understanding more of what you have because that is incredibly valuable it's amazing what you're making and the world needs it so I really hope that I mean, I feel like we've reached the brow of the hill, but you never know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so could you uh, could you tell us a little bit about um, wor- what it is about working with film? Like um, a few minutes ago, you described it as it's almost like you consider your work paintings. What is it about the film medium that's drawn you to it and kept you engaged with it? And have there places where you feel like you're still innovating with it even today? Well, I mean, I well, I mean, I, you could have me on this phone for hours <laughs> um i mean starting at your last question i mean i've started to make films that can only be made on film i think probably as a reaction to um you know this the potential of it was you know very present of losing it but for example uh film which was a project i did for tate Modern's turbine hall i wanted to make a film that was entirely made inside a camera so but could wasn't um so it didn't rely on any uh, post-production at all um other than the simple act of editing now i still edit on a cutting table uh, I, I still cut film with a splice with a splicer and and sellotape it together because that's that's the heart of my um creative process in a way that's when i do my thinking and i need I need the physicality of it. I, I, you know, I need to touch it. You know, it's physical. It's all about physical resistance. So, um, so what I did is that um, I developed a system of, of just um, aperture gate masking, where you could film many things inside one film frame. Because what, that, what provoked the idea was that I really wanted, you know, the turbine hall was a, is a very portrait format space in a way you know and if you turn on an, an anamorphic lens or cinemascope lens just 90 degrees instead of stretching from um left to right which is of course the big landscape thing that everyone's used to and also uh the cinematic you know screen insists on that but in as an in the turbine hall i didn't need to follow any um pre-given things like a screen so i i just turned it 90 degrees and it meant that i could stretch the film frame uh, from top to bottom, which meant that I could have this beautiful portrait format uh, image um, just with turning the lens, you know, nothing else, no other trick, just literally turning a lens. And and so as soon as um, I had this portrait format idea, I just, then it took me so, you know, it was so long to try and work out what it could be a portrait of. And at a certain point, I realized it had to be a portrait of film itself. And in order to do that, I really wanted to um, make or give the uh, impression of, of sprockets on the on the film. And of course, I wanted to do it in a way that you know didn't rely on any sort of you know digital post production. So it had to be inside filmed inside the camera. So um, and then I you know by this very very rapidly developed this aperture gate masking system, which just means that the little gate through which, you know, normally you get the film frame um, had these little plastic masks, you know, with tiny little sprocket holes in it, and then you'd overexpose the inside and then take out and put another mask in and then and slightly less expose the the, the outside of it and take out a mask and put, put cover the sprocket and and, um, and then do the same 
uh, a double, triple, uh, you know, whatever exposure going on inside the frame. And miraculously, it worked because of because of course it had to it had to work. It had to be beautiful film. It had to be beautiful. It had to show what film is capable of. And it's all about you know the, the things that I are of course there's you know the whole debate was fixated on um, you know the superiority of you know and the view view of others was like you know trying to out superior the the grain with the pixel etc cetera, etc cetera, and it was all about the quality of the image but for me it was also much more about the blindness of the process and um, you know everything that the medium can do that you do not deliberately you cannot do yourself uh, which is quite a, a, a important thing in art um, you know you will like for example sometimes I will the chalk will do something that I didn't intend it to do, and I look at it and I think, oh my God, that's that's actually very beautiful. I have to keep that, you know, and that's the medium operating in a way that's non, not deliberate. It's a non-deliberate act, and film does that, you know, very very strongly. It still does that. It will catch light in a way that um, you can't deliberately do. It will even sort of do something that you know maybe. Um, be considered a flaw, but become, but it becomes very perfect for the situation. And this has happened to me throughout my work with film. I mean, the very first, one of the very first films I made, I um, was trying to imitate a film from the 1920s, and I had a, a Kodak camera with it, and I used the light meter on the camera, which was a mistake because the ASAs were all different. And and I, you know, processed one of these films in a bath, and it was completely overexposed so I took the rest to a lab and they just managed to get this image and of course it was m way more beautiful than anything I had even if I'd tried to fake it do you understand mm -hmm. it's like film is forever surprising me right itself without my inter without my m mental uh you know it, whatever how, how do you say it you know me deliberating on something it's doing it itself and then that shows me a better way now, my major anxiety about entering into a completely digital universe is that it's like you forever see what's going on. And therefore, it's all about um, everything is decided. And sometimes life is better when everything isn't all decided. Right. It's like having the lights on the whole time. There's no mystery. No, for me, the biggest thing is that it's a medium of poetry. I, I still have the means to make poetry. And... Um, you know, there, there are lots of reasons, you know, it's materiality is so important, it's physicality, it's, you know, the fact that every single film frame is organically different, um, and the, and the which is a beautiful thing. The spontaneity that you mentioned that is, you know, the, the, in the medium acting in a way that you just can't predict and how that impacts yeah. the art is something that is really exciting to see. And, and it's in lots of types of art, watercolor painting, all kinds of places where things just happen and they're they're traits of the medium so it's uh this is it's fascinating to listen to you kind of work through how you use it and how it impacts the work that you're doing um how long does a project take so for example the turbine hall project how long does that take to come to life for you well no but that was uh <laughs> i mean i was asked in september um i had a big show in in vienna the following uh, March, um, which meant that I couldn't do anything for the turbine hall, and it had to be open the following October. And I remember these dates because they're sort of engraved on my heart. Um, and on the, I had was making three new films, and while they were in the lab, that's when the lab closed. Um, and I ended up writing this article for the Guardian about about the importance of keeping 16 millimeter. You know, at that point, it was just a panic about 16, not the whole of film. And, and I had to go to my opening in Vienna, and that's when I had this sort of panic attack, which began the whole project about I had to make it about film itself. So that was like from March until October. So it was incredibly intense, um, rapid, and terrifying period because, you know, trying to do something as ambitious as develop a system where you can have um, sprockets, you know, 12 and a half sprockets on a on a film. I mean, if, if you know about 
historically, aperture gate masking is very kind of out of focus and, and not very effective. Um, so, you know, that that was rapid yeah, know, yeah. by anybody's standards, but and also I was also having to put the book together. So it was an incredibly intense working period. I mean, it depends. It depends. Deadlines help, of course. Right. Right. Yeah. So in the, in your your a lot of what you've continued to do is really advocate for film. And like as an example, I know you recently were in an event with Christopher Nolan talking about the future of film. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, kind of what you've been doing lately in terms of both your work and then also film advocacy and you know places where people could go if they want to learn more about you know I know safefilm.org is out there different places. What what uh, can you kind of tell us where you're at with all that? Well, um, last, I mean, I'm at, in Los Angeles at the moment. Obviously, I'm not usually based here. I'm based in Berlin normally. But I was the artist in residence at the Getty last year. And one of the reasons I decided to do that was to see if I could, you know, help, uh, you know, do anything about the saving film by bringing it to, to Hollywood in a way. Um, I met up with Christopher Nolan, who is a fantastic advocate for film. He's incredibly smart. And we, um, and then Kerry Brower, who was who's the director of the new uh, Academy Film, you know, they're making a museum here, the Museum of Motion Pictures here, which is affiliated to the Academy. Um, and he's the director, hasn't opened yet. So it was like the, this opportunity, and Kerry comes from the, the art world, actually, and I've worked with him before, so I, I, I know him. So I put together a sort of... I asked Chris if he would be willing to, you know, to be in conversation with me and Kerry because the one thing that I think has not been happening is a, having everybody from all the different aspects of film news actually sit around a table and talk to each other. So I organised at the Getty a round table, um, which was very small, but it had uh, Dawn Hudson from, you know, the CEO of the Academy and... Uh, like Michael Govan, who's from the CEO of LACMA, which is Los Angeles County Museum of Art. So it's like Anne Kerry and Chris and Emma Thomas, his wife and the producer, and then and, and then Jeff Clark, of course, CEO of Kodak, and various and people from Sundance and um, Film Foundation and Archive and Laboratories, Brodsons were there. And everyone, because no, you know, I think, sin, I mean, the, Sadly, I think cinema has been a bit oblivious. Commercial cinema has been very oblivious to the fact that other there are other people that need and use film. Um, and it was the first time everyone actually sat down and had a conversation together. And I think in a way it sort of set the ball rolling. We just redid it in London at the film festival with the, with the BFI and Tate um, Gallery. And you know, these conversations need to happen because, of course, it's a sort of shock to some people to think that anyone cares. Um, you know, the main issue now is um, I think a lot of directors are choosing to use it, um, to originate on it, I think. But the problem is is, is getting it projected, uh, uh, distributed and, and projected again in a way that's not, you know, the multiplexes. It's not, that's not what anyone is asking for now, but it's just it's places or, you know, where you'd expect to see uh, the original experience, the original encounter, like a museum or, or, or you know, in fact, the BFI itself or, uh, you know, any, any cinematech. You know, museums are about protecting the original experience. And the, you know, the, the thought that we could even deplete our world of the original experience of film is quite incredible. But it really, really, really looks like we're, we were perilously close and still are in terms of exhibition um, and projection. So we're trying to get to a point, you know, of course you have Christopher Nolan and um, Tarantino, you know, previewing their films as 70 millimeter experiences before the digital release, which is you know, in a way, the way we have to go. And I know there are muse there are ideas afoot to try and, you know, get some cinema chains that will show film on one screen. Because it wouldn't take so much. But I know for a fact, 
a lot of people that I'm in touch with, and then I, you know, I'm not, they're not all partisan either, but a lot of them would cross a city to see a film as opposed to a digital projection of something, especially if it is a, uh, you know, if it was a, if, if it was always a film. I mean, clearly, it's, uh, you know, cinema that's made digitally is is digital cinema, and but film that was made and is made with film is, you know, cinema, and um, you can choose. You know, I, w- I wanted to see Bridge of Sp- I mean, I knew Bridge of Spies was shot on film, and I phoned any- everywhere to see if um, if there was a film print of it, but it, it isn't or wasn't. You know, that I-, I don't think it would take much to to shift it, but it's just an attitude. Right, just so an attitude. when you were all sitting down together in London recently, what was the conversation like? It's, uh, you know, you're just discussing how you're all in agreement or did you make a plan to well no no i mean we were much more it was much more consensual and new in la than it was in london in london it was um because the bfi wanted to make it much more about distribution um and exhibition in a way that they by exhibition i mean sort of cinema projection really there wasn't um you know there were a lot of distributors there and uh you know cinema chain or cinema owners, and and there's you know there's frustration. There's a you know one uh, picture house. She has a lot of projectors, but she can't get the film. So then it's over to the you know the distributors, and there you know some of them were quite anti the whole idea. Well, it wasn't you know total consensus at all. You know it was like oh I remember you know it was all scratch film and it's heavy and da 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 and all the arguments that we're used to hearing. But then there's you know, at the same time, there are other people who say, well, look, there's huge asset potential for this, which is what I believe. You know, I, I'm i going to the IPIC here in, we, we're in Westwood, so it's just over the road, it's this new cinema, which is quite shocking for my British sensibilities, because it's like being in business class. You know, there's, uh, you sit in these seats, and you can go up and down, and there's, you know, waiter service, and it is exactly TV with other people which is what Nolan um, and what Chris Tarantino said. It really feels like that. Um, but that, is, you know, and then I went to see Interstellar at the Lincoln Center or the IMAX Center in, in New York, and it was really ecstatic. That It was completely packed out. Everyone had their popcorn and their rake seat seating, and it was um, amazing. And that's what, it, we, we, you know, we're just a hair's breadth away from bringing back, you know, the cinematic experience. Because there is a torpor, there's a sort of depression. You know, I mean, they, the, you know, the industry complains about uh, loss of figures and numbers, but I mean, it's clear why. You know, if you don't invest in it in a in a sort of exciting way, it's. You know, and I, I actually also think that the that the medium has had a huge effect on on the making of thing, a film too. You know, you know that another one of the. In fact, we didn't really talk so much about the reasons. I love film, but one of them is also the the discipline, the internal discipline, the material resistance, medium resistance. You know, the, a film is, um, you know, 10 minutes or, three, in my case, 60 millimeter. Sometimes it's a three-minute long roll, and, you know, you make all these decisions. It's a very active thing. You know, digital is much more passive because, you you know, you, you're kind of... Can, you know, it becomes battery length, as someone told me, as opposed to roll length. But it means, you, you know, you don't have to worry so much about, um, the, you know, the finitude. But I think that has been an amazing discipline within cinema. You know, it's brought in the whole artifice of editing. I mean, editing is all about running out of film and how to get to the next place. I mean, it is for me. I mean, I know that. You know, of course you know, now you can do whatever you like, but there was a certain point where if you did not have it, if it wasn't in the negative, you did not have it. You know, you could you, you could only extend it if you repeated the negative, which, of course, is a big thing. So what that would have meant is that people, the editors and filmmakers, had to go and find a different route to get to where they wanted to do because they didn't have it. But now, of course, you can just extend the frame. and um, It's just... You know, lots of tricks, you know, right. can happen. But the, the, the film's internal discipline and the, the, you know, all the things it didn't have, it's, it's um, you know, the ability to repeat a negative, you know, you'd have to go back to the negative. All that stuff is very important to what cinema was and what 
filmmaking was and is. So, okay. you know, there's a lot that's different. It's just different. I mean, the point is, all along, it's just been about saying, it's different, it's different. Right. Can't we have two? Can't yeah. we have both? Right. I mean, even with the turbine hall, and I, there was this, indus- you know, we got together this big industry event, um, British industry event, and I literally said to these, you know, why do you want to only have one way of making cinema again? You know, you've got two ways. You know, why don't you enjoy it? We have loads of mediums. Why don't you want more of one? Why well, go back to this sort of absolutist um, view of life? It's just, anyway, it's for me, it drives me crazy. But. I think it's a great point. The the idea that choice is so important to a crea- creative community and it's going to bring more creativity and more opportunity and there's absolutely I think great things about digital filmmaking and how accessible it is for a new generation to pick it up and start but it shouldn't replace the other medium I I think that just is such an important point and to hear you talk about why you love film I mean are there other things that in there I mean that you would like to to kind of talk about I mean what you talked about the material you talked about how the decisions that you have to make as an artist, is there anything Well, I think else? another thing which I think is completely forgotten, and maybe it applies more to my end of filmmaking than commercial filmmaking, but I think the silence of film is very important. Um, you know, film is, when you, you know, make a film, it's silent, and the action is in adding the sound. Um, so often you see your rushes, you know, silently. And um, it it has created the whole artifice of of sound, which is very important, I think, um, because there's this gap between sound and image. Um, Now, with digital recording, it's, you you know, your action is in taking, if you want to hear it silently, which you, of course, don't, the action is in taking the sound off. Um, you know, I know in commercial cinema that might not be such a parallel, but for me it's an incredibly important um, thing is that I see my images silence with silence and then I imagine them with sound. So, and it it creates to another level um, of of image and sound and then it creates the fiction of the soundtrack, which is extremely important. So that's another reason. The discussion has been really great. I guess I, I just have one last question that I want to ask you, and then we'll, we'll let you go. And, and I guess part of it is, as we've talked through all this and we've talked about your art and things like that, and maybe this question's too broad, but what is it as an artist using film, what is it that you're you're seeking for and that you're trying to explore and get across to your audience? Like, is there does film give you an opportunity to express yourself in a way or explore things in a way that painting and drawing and those other mediums don't? And and what is it that you're, you're seeking as a creative person? You know, it's very difficult to talk about that myself, but there's, um, uh, there, I mean, I had a woman come to my studio yesterday who I did this big exhibition with, and she said, well, you know, I really just, I really long for your films. I long to see them, which was, you know, I, it was great that she said that because it, it is so, I mean, it's difficult for me to say, but what I want, what it is about film and about, um, is the sort of relationship to, to longing in a way. Um, you know, I, I, there's an emotional level in the films that I don't get with my other things. Um, and it is depiction in time in a way um, you know I've, I've filmed a lot of people uh, like you know Merce Cunningham for example um, with film and he, and he and then he dies but the film still exists and it's this incredibly powerful document of that afternoon or those three afternoons in Richmond California when he was you know rehearsing with his dancers and th- that relationship, for me, is intrinsic to my relationship to film and my films. I don't know if I would have the same emotional relationship had it been digitally. I don't know, uh, but I know that I would never have... It's something about 
the f- finitude of you know the finite quality of the, f- the film and and the subject and um the organic nature of the film and and all is about depiction of that moment you know the moment in time so that's what i i try with my films to to recreate the atmosphere of very small moments afternoons or a morning or um i just have no you know like i have no attraction to ever using acrylics because of the plastic quality it doesn't turn me on in any way it's just a you know that's i'm an artist don't use acrylic i would be more attracted to oil or whatever i would i don't have that attraction to use digital for that it's just a, a medium thing mm. i i would for that subject for that situation for me it has to be this organic medium which is film so and i it's a, you know, it's about time. It's so much about time. Um, it's so much about the the movement in the frame. It's it's so much about the the grain to some extent, and so much also, as I said, for what I don't know I'm going to get, but then get. Right. Um, it's the mystery. It's the it's the blindness. It's you know, this is another thing I should say, which you know, of course, makes less sense in commercial cinema from my conversations with Chris, I know this, but for me, you know, I, when I film something and then it goes off to be processed and, you know, it takes time, there's this forgetting that happens. Um, You forget what you film to some extent. And then there's this moment when you, you, you see it again, but the seeing again, between the forgetting and the seeing again, is this huge area of creative thinking um, that is quite difficult to explain without sounding crazy. But it's, it's a really important part of the whole thing, is the lack of immediacy, the lack of... It's like, for me, it's something, the difference between having the lights on the whole time and actually having darkness, right. you know, being able to turn them off. It's something like that. You know, I I love that forgetting it, forgetfulness, and I've forgotten it, and then I'm re-surprised. But because I'm re-encountering it, a whole load of other things are happening. Right. Um, these are very, very sort of you know tangential things, but they're quite profound. I mean, you know, these are all the things which are much more akin to poetry right. than a sort of practical view of the world. And I mean, I'm on the I, I am much more drawn to the poetic rather than the practical you know that's what you want society wants its artists and its poets to be like that and its writers you know they don't want us all sort of kind of practical people who you know dealing with things practically and getting things done and seeing what you're doing the whole time and you want us to be sort of occluded in some way and so i have to say these are the things that why film is so important because it creates a language for us you know yeah. That that tiny minority in society, but you actually need us. So yeah, yep. and, and I, one of the things with your work that I I've watched a lot of it in, in in preparing for this interview, and the one thing that I think is really fascinating about film and the way that you use it is that to, like it's an invitation for me to participate with you in that moment in a way that a painting mm-hmm. isn't because it's it's a still image, and you you look at it, but I find that when I'm watching the film work that you've done in the setting that it's in, you're waiting for that next second. You're waiting to see what's going to happen. There's a participation of the audience with you in the creative process that I think is really exciting. And I don't know if it could be captured in another medium. So well, I, I know it couldn't. I mean, I know it could. I mean, there's so much in my films that is film time. Um, and that's the point. Yeah. Film time is a, is a different time from you know, real time from narrative time. It's film time. And, um, you know, and there's a sort of longer in my films, you know, they're slow and they use film time to their advantage. But it is film time, you know. There was this amazing thing that Walter Murch said in London um, about the difference between filming an empty room with digital and with film, um, you know, with with digital, you know, you're looking at the same scene, but it's as if somebody has just left, 
whereas with film, you have this medium carries the anticipation and you think that someone's going to enter. And I think it was one of the smartest things anyone has said about the two. And it's to do with the fact that, and, and Chris Nolan nailed it, you know, film, every frame is different. So the picture might be the same, but the image, you know, the actual film frame is different. So there's a sense of anticipation being built. Whereas digital is the same thing repeated. Right. You know, it's just, you know, still, still is just the, is, is the same thing repeated. Whereas a still in film, if it's still, not, no action, it's a difference, still moving. You know, in a way, that's the, the difference. It's quite profound, that. But it is something about, um, antici- you know, anticipation and the, the movement between the frames because it's still moving. You know, it's still moving. Even if you actually stilled it, Yes, you know, so you actually, you made it still, like as he, he made the relationship to um, Chris Marker's La Jetée. It's still images, but of course it's still moving, whereas you have a still image in digital, it's, the same, it's just, it's like exactly the same as a still image. It's just still. You know, it's, it's a different, it's a different thing. It's to do with each, each, the movement that happens, you know, internally within the chemistry. It's about chemistry, which makes me about alchemists, you know, alchemy and all those relationships. It's just the most tremendous invention. That's what, the, you know, should never underestimate how amazing it is to have created this medium to depict life in ourselves in this wondrous way. Um, it isn't, you know, through chemicals, through chemistry, light and lenses. It's beautiful. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> couldn't think of a of a better way to stop than that last little segment you said. I mean, we couldn't agree more. It, it's been it's been wonderful to talk to you and to to hear more about your creative process and your work. And we very much appreciate your advocacy and passion for film. And we share it. And we appreciate you very much coming on our first episode of the Conakry. No, it's a pleasure. <laughs> thank you. All so right, much. thank you. Everybody out there, thank you for listening. Tessa, to thank you for coming. And we'll talk to you all again soon. It is a great satisfaction to be able to speak to you through the medium of this wonderful invention.